<laughs> yeah, we're live. It is 1140. Hope everybody had a good evening last night. And you're already up and going and working on your projects and stuff. So let's get a little project motivation going. I need some of that too. I need to, excuse me, I need to get my 400 small block up and going. And that made me start to think about a couple of things. Um, and that is the thing I want to talk about today is <laughs> ostensibly uh, rockers and and more specifically, how do we adjust them? So if we take a look at uh, with an LS motor, which we normally which we talk about a lot. I mean, LS is is still far and away the biggest market out there. It's way bigger than small block Chevy and Ford and Dodge and all that stuff. It's it's it, it is the market. Guys may get tired of it. And I understand that because there's lots of stuff out there, but that's because there's a lots of stuff out there. A uh, uh, lots of stuff. That's a technical term. That, that's because there's, you know, people are getting into it. It's inexpensive. It's easy to make power. They're good motors. There are lots of other good motors too. But right now, that is the biggest thing out there. But we're not going to talk about LS rockers because they just bolt down and it's not hard. You don't really adjust the rocker so much as you adjust the push rod length. That's a different thing. What we want to talk about today is adjusting rockers where you have to adjust either the lash or the preload at the rocker and not with a push rod link. So if we have some kind of, it doesn't matter whether it's a solid flat tappet or a solid roller, whether it's a hydraulic roller or a hydraulic flat tappet, there's still some sort of adjusting procedure that's necessary. So if you're, if you're building the motor, maybe you're putting new rockers on, maybe you're swapping from stock stamp steel rockers, like on a big block Chevy or small block Chevy or, or Fords, and you're going to a, a roller rock or setup, maybe you've just swapped cams and you just have to put the rockers back on. What is your guys' let me know in the comments? What is your adjustment procedure? How do you go about it? Lots of different guys have different procedures, and I see that all the time. I do it one way. Brule, who's in the photo here, <laughs> the, the amazing Steve, the carb whisperer, Steve Brule from West Tech, does it a different way. Um, other people that are there do it differently. And the question is, what is the best way? So <laughs> let me know in the comments. First of all, I want to know what way you you use. What do you guys do when you're adjusting rockers? So there are a number of different ways. One is to, some guys like to, uh, when they're adjusting it, you're obviously rotating the motor around to get the cam in the right position. Some, some, some people do the intake open and close and then look at that position so that they know that the, but basically what they're doing there is they, they want to make sure that when you're adjusting the, the lash or the preload, that the, the lifter is on the heel of the camshaft. So, it, and it's easy for you guys that are new. Um, what that means is that when you're spinning the, the camshaft around, when the, you know, the pointy part of the lobe, <laughs> when that's either opening or closing the valve, once it gets past a certain point, once it's closed to a certain point, from there, all the way around the lobe until it starts opening again, all of that area can be used to adjust the to adjust the rocker. It doesn't have to just be when the exhaust is in a certain point or when the intake is at a certain point. It, you can use that all the way around, but that's a that's another kind of advanced level kind of thing. So no matter how you adjust it, where you where you put the intake versus the exhaust, the intake versus the exhaust, however you do that, that's fine. You just make sure that the that the lifter is on the heel of the cam, and then you either put a certain amount of lash in it using a fueler gauge, or you put a certain amount of preload in it. You know, a lot of times we just do a half turn or something like that, make sure that we're we're plunging the lifter just a little bit so we have a little bit of preload in it so that there's no lash in, in a setup like that has a hydraulic flat tappet or a hydraulic roller. So, but th that's not the question. The question is now, what is your procedure? What order do you go in? Do you do... Like I said, you can follow the firing order. So you could do, um, you know, one, eight, four, three, six, five, seven, two. You can do that. You can do, uh, some guys do all of the intakes. You know, you can do this intake, then that intake, then that intake, going down the line of that, of that cylinder head and then go do the next one, or just do all the intakes in, in the order of the firing order. You can do all the exhaust, the same thing. You could, <laughs> you can do, um, the way that I do it is you can do one side of the motor and then the other side. Um, I, I, and I just go in a row and I usually, a lot of times I will even mark them. I, I just put a little mark on the, on the um, valve cover facing where the valve cover mounts on the cylinder head, just to know that I did that one. The, and the reason that I do that is while I'm doing it, I know which one I'm doing. 
But sometimes while you're doing that, you get called away or something else happens and you have to leave. I have to go get my camera. I have to go talk to somebody. I have to go help out do, doing something else. And then I come back and I'm like, I, unless the, the, the wrench and the, and the Allen are both sitting right there on the one that I'm doing, I did. I won't always remember exactly which one I'm doing. So I like to mark them. So I go on one side of the motor and then go around and then do the other side of the motor. And then, then I'm done. So the question is, what is the best way to do this? What is the absolute best way to do this? Is there one way that's better than all the others? So you guys let me know in the comments. Let's see. Go ahead and do a poll up here. Okay, so the question will be, is following the firing order the best way to adjust the rockers? Is that the best way? So, and, and I'm sure there are, we have a lot of guys out there that have done a lot of that because you have to do that essentially every time you build a motor, every time you change a camshaft, every time you change the rockers, every time you change push rods or lifters or anything, every time you when a lot of times when we're running a motor on the dyno, when we break in a motor, we like to go in and then take the valve covers off and check. And especially if we have something that has lash in it, you want to go and check and see, hey, it, is the lash still the same? W what did it change from, you know, a cold lash to a hot lash? Did the lash grow a lot? Do we have a cam lobe that's going away? Do we have a stud that's pulling out? You know, th this gives us an idea of what could be happening after the break-in procedure is something already going wrong or is everything okay? And if everything is okay, then you would go in and check all the lash. If it's all good, you might have to adjust it a thou or two or whatever. And then uh, you could put it back to where you want it to be. And then you could continue going with your procedure. But the question again is what is the best way to do this? What, what is the best, most effective, fastest, you know, I, I don't know, most efficient way to do this. And the, so that you guys know, because this discussion obviously is going to be about something else. This is a big lead in. Um, the When we're looking at something, when we're looking at a problem like this or a question like this, like what what is the best way? What I would recommend is you step back and look at the goal. So what is the end? What is the what is the thing you're trying to achieve here? OK, so when you have a motor and you've you've put new rockers on or you put a camshaft in or, or, or whatever the thing that caused the need for you to adjust this, what's the end goal? Well, the end goal is to have all of the rockers adjusted properly, right? Wh whether that's 20,000 slash because it's a solid roller or, or a solid flat tap it uh, or whatever the lash number is or, or a half, half turn or preload if it's a hydraulic deal. Whatever that is, that's the end goal, right? So you want you want to get to a point where all of the rockers are adjusted the same, properly and the same, and then the motor's ready to run, right? So that's the goal. So the question then becomes, um, how do you achieve that? And the answer is you can achieve that many different ways. So you can do it the way that I do it, just go in line. Because and, and the reason that I choose that is not because I think it's the best. In fact, <laughs> as a analytical moderate, I know that that's not the best. Um, and I'm not concerned with that. And I'm not concerned with telling people that they should do it that way because I don't think that they should. My mind works that way. And that's easiest for me. Maybe because that's the way that I originally started. That's the way they did all the five liter Ford stuff. Maybe that's the path that I went down and that's the way that I do it. And now it's habit. And so that's just easiest for me. It's, it's, it's Henry Ford's assembly line thing. Hey, if you get somebody doing something the same every time, they get really good at it. And that's, that's the way that it is for me. This is the way that I do it. This is the way I continue to do it. There might be better, faster, or more efficient ways. But for me to get past being ultra efficient the way that I'm doing it and do something that's more efficient, I'm going to go through a procedure or a time when it's not as efficient. And quite honestly, I just, <laughs> I just don't want to do that. So this is the way that works for me. But again, that's not absolute. And, and really, that's the lesson here. 
if we step back and look at this thing and go, hey, look, all we need to do is get these all these rockers adjusted so that they're all the same. I go back and I usually check them and, and double check them, make sure that they're all OK, and then put the valve covers on and then we go test. The end result is you get to the same point. So a guy could do it the way that I do it, going in line on one side, going in line on the other side, put the valve covers on, boom, you're away. He could he could do it uh, following the firing order. He could do all the intakes. He could do all the exhaust. The end result is the same thing. We got all the rockers adjusted, and now the motor is ready to run. And the the real answer to all of this is, is that it doesn't matter. There are lots of good ways to get this done. And if a guy is, if, is proficient and that's the way that he does it, and he wants to follow the firing order, he wants to do all the intakes first, he wants to do all the exhaust first, all of that works. This leads us into our, our discussion. If we now take that and apply that, to other things. So <laughs> the, the, the there are many things. You could apply it to politics. You could apply it to religion. You could apply it to your favorite color. What, what people, somebody who's telling you that this procedure for adjusting rockers is the best, best procedure and you should just do it this way. This is, this is the absolute way. You should do it this way. Doesn't really understand what the end goal is. And he also doesn't understand why he's saying what he's saying. He's not saying it because he's giving you good information. He's not saying you, he's not trying to teach you something. What he wants is validation that the way that he chose is the right way. And that that's absolute. It can't just be right for him. Like mine is right for me. Brulee's is right for him. And then quite honestly, he's very, very good at it. We call him lightning lash. So he's very good at adjusting it the way that he does it. He's been doing it for years. He's very proficient at it and he knocks it out. And that's why we call him lightning lash. And I, and I think that that's fantastic. He can also be good at the way that he does it. And I can be good at the way that I do it. And there doesn't have to be a conflict there. There doesn't have to be a battle of which way is better. And, and that's what's going on. There's a lot of that in the industry. We see that in the guys that are talking about the LSAs for these cams. Oh, you have to look at it this way. Well, we don't have to look at it that way any more than we have to do rocker adjustments in a particular procedure. If you think that the way that you're looking at camshaft design or, or rocker adjustment, or any other thing that we're doing with in the automotive industry, that there's only one correct way to do it. What you're doing is falling prey to a natural human tendency. And that's for us to go out and seek validation because we're insecure, because we want validation that the way that we chose is the absolute right way. And I can tell you I don't even have to know what your way is. I'll tell you that it's not right and it's not absolute. The cool thing is it can be right for you. You can pick it like with the camshaft thing. Okay, you're, this cam has to have this LSA. It doesn't really because that there's no LSA thing that's going to give you the magic cam that makes more power at 1500 and at 7000 than every other camshaft the way that a lot of these guys are thinking that it does. David Visor doesn't think that by the way, for you guys, for you LSA guys, he doesn't feel that way. He knows that that's not the case. We've had conversations. I've explained to him that people are not doing that. People are not buying camshafts based on the fact that the some magic LSA formula. I said, they're not doing that. They're buying it for a lot of other different reasons. And again, that's looking at the end result of the picture. Hey, what is the best camshaft? Well, a tight LSA camshaft isn't the best camshaft because it doesn't solve the problem that a guy's looking at to solve. He wants a he wants a good idle, he wants the chop, he wants fuel mileage. He wants the thing to make power in this power band. He wants it to be inexpensive. All of these things are reasons why guys would choose other things. So there can never be an absolute thing any more than there can be an absolute way for guys to adjust rockers. There doesn't have to be. That's the point. <laughs> if we're making a camshaft work, and we go from the valve event procedure and arrive at the same thing. If we solve the problem and give a person the camshaft that they want, that, that gives them the thing that they want, because again, this best camshaft notion or the best rocker adjustment notion is highly subjective. <laughs> My way is good for me and I'm, I'm good with that. Same thing with camshafts. A guy that wants a, a torque cam or a truck Norris cam doesn't want this summit stage four or the Brian Tooley stage four. He doesn't want that. Those are different cams that 
would achieve different things, uh, would achieve different goals for different desires. The and and each one of them would be the best cam for these guys because they would <laughs> they would give the thing that the guy wants. So first, obviously, disavow people of the notion that there there is any sort of like best cam, despite the fact that <laughs> Matt sells the best cam, which is awesome. Um, there isn't that any more than there's an absolute procedure, any more than there's an absolute favorite color or absolute, you know, political affiliation or religious affiliation or any of those things. There isn't. There, the, the, the thing could be right for you. And if it is right for you, like the way that I do my rockers <laughs> is right for me. And, and I'm probably not going to change that. I, I know that Brule and we've had conversations about this. He's like, why don't you do it like this? I'm like, I, I want to. I want to be Lightning Lash Jr., but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I can't do that. It doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for me to go from one side of the motor to the other and follow the firing order. I said, it's just not, that's, I'm just not wired like that. This, this works for me all in a row and this all in a row. And that, that's just, that's the way that I'm wired and it works best for me. So let's see what you guys got going on. Enough ranting for me. Bear, bear, bear. Whatever works. Points, Michael. That's perfect. <laughs> Sergeant, what's going on? Customs, Lamont, Lamont's garage. All right, cool. Are you are you actually at? Are you, are you actually in France? Ah, France cold beverage. Uh, I take the load off the rocker and tighten until I can barely rotate fingers and then adjust it. Yeah, you're just getting it down to uh, zero lash before you adjust it. That's pretty normal. I don't have rockers on my rotary. Perfect. See, that's also a win. I mean, that's 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 perfect. I've read spin the push rod and tighten it until it's stiff to turn, then tighten it 180. Yeah, that's a half turn. That's half turn or preload. That's what we're talking about. Hydraulic lifter, praying to everyone as well. I do one side at a I do none sides at a time. I have short travel lifters. I just installed them at zero lash. Yeah, short travel lifters are a lot more precise in their adjustment. Get it on the base circle and run them down to zero lash, and then give them a tiny bit of play by feel. I use the rock then adjust method using the firing order. See, that's all good. Those are all lashed to 10 to 12. I forgot the oil filter, so hopefully tomorrow will be the first start. Okay, Turbo Central, let me know. That We're excited about that, man. We're right there with you. <laughs> right there on the startup. We'll all be cheering if it starts. Have someone do it for you who's <laughs> fastest but not safest. Does the method matter if they're adjusted correctly, Sergeant? That's it. That's uh, you. You nailed it. That that's the thing. We all don't have to be the best way. Each cylinder individually at TDC, beginning of power stroke, three quarter turn past zero lash for hydraulic at spec feeler gauge for mechanical. Yeah, it doesn't have to be at TDC. Just anywhere on the anywhere on the base circle of the cam. But again. If if people want to go, you know, intake open, exhaust close, or whatever the method is that they're doing, if people want to go do that, when this valve moves, then I can adjust this one. When this one does this one, I could do this one. That's fine, and that works. And and again, if you're if that's the way that you work and your mind works like that, normally that's the way that I do it when I'm when I'm going in a row. But if you if that's the way that it works, that's fine. But if you also understand that, hey, once the valve once the push rod stops moving, then I'm on the I'm on the base circle of the cam. That that also works. I would though. I've done. I've never done it just because there's less spinning of the motor. Yeah, there there is that. I use a paint marker. I just all the ones that are on the base circle and then mark them. Then turn the crank until the others are on the base circle and mark them. Lash is done and they're all marked. See, that's another way. That's cool. I think the safest way is the fastest way because doing it again is time consuming. So following the fire order is a good way. That's that's one way to do it. I do one side then the other. Yeah, I just I'm just going in a row <laughs> works for me. It's symmetrical, right? So with many things in life, whatever works for you, what works for me may not be great for you as long as it gets the job done. Yeah, I I sit there and watch Brule do it when he's doing when I'm there and he's working on another motor. And he's doing the lash. I I just watch him and have him do his thing. I don't tell him you that's dumb. You shouldn't do it like that. <laughs> just do it the way that I do it. Right. Hmm. 
<laughs> Thumper shots shots fired at Punisher. One wheel peel, nice. Uh oh, nine seconds free car. It's getting ugly up in here. Uh, what's your favorite firing order? Not what's best, but your personal preference. I don't have one. I don't. I don't care about firing order. All I care about is that the motor runs and it <laughs> makes noise, and then I can adjust it and change something. Change the tune on it. Change the headers on it. Change the camshaft. Change change the intake manifold so that I can get more data. My my jams are that my jams are the dyno curves. I love getting to the point where first of all, I, I love. I get excited when the motor runs <laughs> for the first time. Or like even when I put the L33 up, which has now has hundreds and hundreds of runs. Every time I put it up and it fires up, like on the first pull, the first time I try to start it, I'm excited. And then when I get to the point where I can actually, uh, you know, throw the tune on it, when I can tune it and it's working perfectly, that's great. And then when I swap something and put a cam in and I start it up again for the first time with a new cam, that's awesome too. But the thing that I look forward to more than anything when I'm dyno testing is when I'm going through a, a bunch of runs and I get to the end point where I've done all the tuning, I've stabilized the the oil temperature and the water temperature and all that stuff, and then I make the run and then I mark it final. And then so I, when I have a bunch of final numbers up there, like the final camshaft, final cylinder head, final, you know, whatever, turbo or whatever, then when I have a bunch of final numbers up there, that's when I get excited. Le Mans Garage, you know what your Le Mans weighs. I'm weighing mine as soon as the snow is gone. Hopefully it's around 3,000. <laughs> you have adjustable LSA. That's the nice thing about a twin cam motor. I had to turn off my Wi-Fi so the live heat's off buffering. Bufferino. Adjustable LSA is fun. Yeah, it'd be nice. Yeah, David's awesome. Uh, let's see. I scrolled past it here. I wish David Visor would have sent back the Turbo Dodge head. I have that head. He did send it back. 12 degrees outside, 80 in my shop. Ooh, that's nice. <laughs> Put too much wood in the stove. Now it's a sauna, right? Is a 393 Ford Stroker good for a turbo build? Yes. Although I don't think you need that big of a camshaft in a turbo combination. Just get shaft rockers, bolt them down with the correct push rather length. Don't really need adjustments. Shaft rockers normally have, um, for small block Chevys and big blocks and that kind of stuff, shaft rockers normally have uh, an adjustable end. I've lived in southern Wy oh, Wyoming, I guess. Oh, or Wisconsin my whole life. Never a snowmobile guy. I, I remember watching those when I was up in Shannonville at the um, the uh, race school that I went up to. Watching, the, there were guys there that were um, drag racing snowmobiles, which is very, very cool. So video that David stressed the importance of a tight LSA to me. I thought he was talking about a race engine or people misunderstanding him. So <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I mean, you know, he, he's kind of made himself a, a David and Goliath. <laughs> David and Goliath. That's good. Um, a David and Goliath against for somehow positioning himself against the cam manufacturer, saying that they don't know what they're doing. And that's, that's not the case. Uh, again, they, they're not designing cams to, any more than the OEMs are designing cams to make it the most powerful cam. So if you buy it like this Extreme Energy 224 cam or the 274 cam for Ford that's been around for a long time, and I've used it a lot and it's worked well for a lot of applications, is it the most powerful cam? No, there are other cams that make more power. But again, they didn't make it for that. They didn't make try to make the most powerful cam to think that that's the case is to not understand why people buy cams. It's not, it's not that they don't understand how to make cams because they do. <laughs> they, 
But what they know more than obviously the people that are thinking a tight LSA cam is the ultimate cam, they know what people are going to buy. And people are not going to buy every cam doesn't need to be a tight LSA cam. In fact, if you look at the offerings that are out there for a tight LSA cam, you're not going to find people buying a lot of those exception obviously is the truck Norris cam. I think part is because, uh, but it's not specifically a tight LSA cam chef. Um, it has a great name and it's very effective. Uh, but <laughs> you know, we've talked about this idle quality and cost and, and, and chop and, and stock converter use and all of these things just that go into why people get camshafts. Snowmobiles have been rolling here all day. They finally had enough snow. Unusual for us not to have this much snow this far into January. Unless I missed it, I've yet to find a good video on how to measure proper pushrod length on a small block Chevy. I think I found one for LS, and I feel like this is get, gets overlooked a lot when assembling engines. The way that I do it for a small block Chevy with an adjustable rocker is I take and we we use uh, an adjustable push rod for small block Chevys to find out what length, if it's a brand new combination that has some sort of unusual head or whatever. And so we put uh, an adjustable push rod that's going to be close to the length within the range of adjustability. And what I do if I want to do it very quickly is I put the put that particular um, valve on the heel of the cam and then I adjust the rocker to where we see the rocker be kind of, I like it. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I don't know if whether it's parallel or perpendicular, but what I'm looking at is contact patch on the, on the rocker or on the valve tip. Um, I, I like to start with, like we mark the valve tip and with the thing stationary, I just put the rocker on, on the, on that push rod leg and move the push, move the rocker back and forth to see what the, what the contact pattern is. If it's in the middle, I know that I'm really, really close. And from there, we will go to a push rod that's that length or, or as close as we can find to that length with the, and you could do this. We do, we do it with the stock valves, for example. And then we'll rotate the motor and see what the contact patch actually is while it's sweeping. And if it's sweeping in the middle of the valve, then we have the push rod length right. That's the way that I do a small block Chevy. Or, or a small block forward, or big block forward, all, all of those that have adjustable rockers like that. Richard, Punisher and I are involved in a YouTuber thing. We go back and forth like this all the time. No, that's all good, man. It's, it should be like that. You should, you should, there should be some smack talk. So would a 331 small book Chevy junkyard dog have a good dyno curve with 445 foot pounds of torque at 3,700 and 470 horsepower? That that sounds like a good combination, right? Uh, would you ever do a big bang out of Dodge 47? I've never even, I think I've only ever seen one in the wrecking yard, but it's not it's not really on the list of things that I want to do. Saturday, it's, uh, where's the pizza at? <laughs> Richard, what happened to making your own line of camshafts? I'm not doing that right now. I love seeing the dino curves. Richard's okay for rockers to move side to side. Yeah, there's going to be some side movement to that. If you look at the, um, both from the way that the, um, the clips that are holding the, you know, the bearing assembly in the center of the rocker, there's going to be some side movement on that. I've had the best luck setting valves with cylinder one and cylinder six TDC method. Okay. Yeah. If you have a procedure that works for you, you, you need to stick with it. David is looking at things from a certain perspective. Not everyone has the same perspective, but he knows how to squeeze power from an engine. No, he, David's a great guy. Even just sitting there listening to his stories is is a worthwhile deal because he's done a lot of stuff and he's a sharp guy. Um, and and didn't want to understand when I was explaining to him why people buy cash. And why would but, but why do people care about that? I'm like, yeah, exactly. Why do they care about idle clips? You know, 
why is that a thing? But but it is. And you have to understand that every bit as much as you have to understand valve events and, and how they're going to correspond to different power levels. And the other thing that's important is like when we we're talking about adjusting the rockers. So if, if we were asking what is the best way to adjust rockers, does it matter that I told you one way or that somebody like a, a real somebody like John Cozzi or Smokey Eunuch or Leonardo da Vinci, it doesn't matter, pick whatever Stephen Hawking's pick, the smartest guy in the world, Albert Einstein's telling you, look, this is the way you should adjust rockers. Does that matter? Does it matter how sharp the guy is or how well respected he is or what kind of legend in the industry is? No, it doesn't matter because those people fall prey to this thing that I'm talking about just as much or, or sometimes even more so because they're, you know, supermen. They fall prey to that human frailty thing just as much as other people do. And also there's no absolute. And so it doesn't matter where the absolute comes from or how much credential they have, or any of that. It, it's still the same thing. You should do it your way if you have a procedure that works for you, and, and I should do it my way, and it's and it's all right. But having Leonardo da Vinci tell, tell you, I might try his way. <laughs> One of the greatest free thinkers ever. But just lash with shims as like a European or motorbike engine, and you will appreciate every possible process adjusting valves on any adjustable rocker system. Yeah, we had to do shims on the focus motor, and we also had to do shims on the, I think it was the Suzuki motor, um, because it had the buckets on it, and so we had to shim those. So I've, I've been down that road a few times. From what I understand, a tight LSA will take away from the low end. In some cases, that's probably not what you want. Would you agree with that at all? No, it's actually the opposite of that. Tight LSAs tend to enhance low speed power. If you look at the LSA test that I did, which I get quoted quite often from the LSA guys, like, oh, yeah, the 108 made more power everywhere. No, actually, it didn't. <laughs> the, the wider LSA made more peak power. And so, and that's exactly what you would expect. Tight LSA stuff usually is better again, like an intake runner length is better in the lower RPM ranges and lower could mean from the, the, the horsepower peak or even beyond that all the way down to whatever the starting RPM range is. So a tighter LSA usually is, is lower engine speeds. Never too early for a good pizza. I agree. Aren't all circle track cams uh, low F, low LSA? The short track stuff seems to be in that range where they don't care about idle quality and stuff. Yes, that engine placed 10th in the engine master's 461 heads. With 461 heads? what What class was that in? Richard, have you had any experience with a sloppy stage three on a six liter? No, we just ran it on the five three, but you're going to see um, the same kind of thing. It, it's a pretty good cam. It's a fairly powerful camshaft. Tim, what advice do you need? Do you need advice on pizza? <laughs> My 455s and 400s start making torque around 2,000 RPM and carry it to 5,000. The 455 makes 500 foot, foot pounds that entire range. Do you have any 400 small block videos? There are some small 400 small block videos up on the channel. I ran a 400 that I did with an aftermarket block, which was a I think was a Speedmaster block, if I remember right. But we ran a 671 or an 871 on it. We ran a few different things. I think that that might be the motor that we did the blower cam versus the NA cam, NA and boosted. Yeah, 
you have to understand camp companies. If you just follow the description and the catalog, you'll be close. They do not want you to fail. No, they, and again, that's why I test all of this stuff so people can see. People are under the misconception that when you, when I test something, or I test these two cams or these four cams or these eight cams, that I'm trying to show you what the most powerful cam is. I'm not. I'm not trying to design a camshaft. I'm not trying to make the most power. What I'm showing you is here, if you were to run these cams, here's what they do. Here, here's what you could expect. And then you get to choose, you know, maybe this one makes more low speed power. This one makes more high speed power. Which one of those things do you want? You get to choose that. And that's why I do the testing. And, and that's a common misconception with people. Next time I'm getting for my Hemi, I'm copying the Chapacabra from TSP on a custom cam motion because TSP doesn't make the cams for the 03 to 08 engines or the 6.1. Okay, Dylan, you should look at, Brian Tooley has um, Hemi cams out now. What's the best American engine in your opinion? I don't know how to answer that. I, I, don't, I don't think that there's a best. And, I, and the important thing is that there doesn't have to be a best. <laughs> the Da Vinci method does sound cool. It does. I think I need to make that mine, right? Somehow. Let's see Bill Hoskinson's from SRC, Bob McClay, and Nolan from Miski Cams are going to possibly build a 327 with a factory double humps and 430 horsepower gold. Well, a, a factory fuelie head, some of the ones I tested were near 210 CFM. That's, that's more than enough to support that power level if you do lots of other things to that motor. I don't think I'm real crazy about buckets. I love the double overhead cam four valve stuff. The thing that was difficult about it is that you have to disassemble everything. You have to take all the cams out and then take the buckets out and then reshim it and put it all back together and then remeasure it. But you do get pretty good at the relationship and you think that it would be one-to-one -one is uh, with adjusting the, the lash, putting the, a lash cap or, a, or some sort of, um, we cut out shims putting shims on it and then putting the bucket on and taking the lash away. And you get pretty good at it after a while. And the nice thing is after you measure one and check them, if they're all pretty consistent, you know what kind of shim stack you have to use. Front wheel, excited to hang out and play the dice game. That's right. And MPMC is coming up. <laughs> For old engines, the Pontiac is the best. See, you, you should think that if you're driving a Pontiac and you like Pontiacs, you should think that. Made too many mistakes on past recommending pizza. Just stick with your tried and true. I don't like to, I don't normally go exotic pizzas. Um, and I don't like, I don't like pizzas with um, sauce on top of the cheese. To me, that's not right. <laughs> and again, that's my that's my opinion. Pizza should be dough and then sauce and then cheese and then topping. You know, a classic. Two thousand seven EMC was only one class, eleven to one pump gas, no roller cams. So why if why would somebody use a 461 head then if they were in that class? Could could you not use an aftermarket head? Is there a lower RPM that a tight LSA does take away from maybe down at 1500 RPM? I, I, having the cam affect anything at 1500 RPM, I think would be a would be a tall ask anyway. But I don't think so. I think a tighter LSA is going to help all the way down if there is even a change down there. Uh, 
Uh, Butler took sixth in the 2003 MC Pontiac. <sighs> yeah, I forgot about the turbo oil return. Time to drill and tap. Yeah, did you? Are you are you going into the block or are you going into the pan? Why is it that every cam kit online comes with 7.4 push rods? Is measuring push rods not important after doing a cam swap? Upgrading to dual springs? Well, the springs have nothing to do with that. And if the cam base circle is the same as stock, and stock has a 7.4 inch push rod, which is what they're saying it is, um, then then you, what they're giving you usually is a hardened push rod instead of the factory push rod, which the factory push rod works really well in most cases, unless you're going really really heavy on the spring and lots of RPM and stuff. Then then we like we have a hardened push rod in that five three that we are running out up pretty high but unless they change the base circle the push rod length isn't going to change if they did then the push rod length is going to change but if it does change you still have a pretty big range of acceptability <laughs> in the push rod length um because you have between a quarter turn and a turn and a half or turn and three quarters maybe of preload you have that range to play with. So you can get, get away with a pretty big change in push rod length. Try LSAs reduce idle quality. That's pretty typical. Yep. Whiskey shims and the XKE had to grind the shims. Why Pontiac is the best. 406 miles an hour in 1960. I know, but that's not, that doesn't make it the best. That that tells us why you like it, and that's awesome, but it, it's not an absolute thing. What testing do you have coming up? Have you picked up anything cool from the machine shop? I have a small block 400 that I picked up, and also the 3800 should be coming up before too long. I converted a set of Quad four hydraulic lifters to solids did nothing for power RPM. We see that a lot. I, I remember Mahovitz going through that on the um, on the modular Ford stuff too. I'm a hobbyist blacksmith. Oh, that's very cool. Did you name your hammer um, your blacksmith hammer? Did you, did you name it Milnir? Since the 5150 steel my current can is made of is a good steel for large knives. Can I make one? Can I make you one if I swap the cams? So you're going to make a, a knife out of the camshaft, the cam knife? So what well, we have to call that. You have, we have to come up with a good name. I'd love to try Chicago deep dish pizza. That's the other thing about, and in our discussion about rockers and the best way to do rockers, what's the best pizza? Is it, is it, deep dish is it new york style is it chicago style is it thin crust what what is it again they're all good they're all good except for the ones that have the sauce on top <laughs> I, can't, I can't do that upper oil pan okay turbo central casserole pizza gets boring rather quickly when the option is around you slice or two once a year I'm indifferent to pineapple on pizza. I love pineapple, but I don't really like it on pizza, though. Same thing with carrots. I love carrots, but I don't like cooked carrots. It's just a weird thing. I did as a protest just to show the power you could make without spending big money on aftermarket parts. The 461 heads had 167 cc ports and flow. Oh, 270. That, that's why you use those heads. That's, that's a lot for those heads. Who doesn't love a, I'm sure that's supposed to be love instead of move, uh, a high RPM V8. Yep, the sound is good. The the 7700 RPM deal running this motor sounds great. And <laughs> all of the people that are there when you run one of these motors at West Tech, uh, one of these high RPM motors, they're all waiting for it to end. They're like, that's, right, that's, that's going, it's going, it's, it's going, keep going, keep going. I like the Trinity intake. Yep. 
Richard, you put new piston rings in when you got them or reuse the old rings. Um, the All of the Big Bang motors had the old rings in it. And all of the junkyard ones basically have this, the, the original rings in them. My dream car is a McLaren F1. Richard, it would take a while to explain why Pontiac is the best engine ever. Not enough room here. It wouldn't make any difference what your explanation is. <laughs> if, you, if you think that it, it is the best, if you think that it's more than the best for you, then you missed the whole discussion earlier today. I like Pontiacs. I like testing them. In fact, I'm going to be testing them very, very soon. <clears throat> but there is no best. There's a best for you, and that's awesome. And I and I will stand with you and support that. You're right to think that that's the best. It's just not the best for everybody. Oh, Dylan, they don't make the... They don't make cams for the earlier Hemis. I remember talking to Brian about that. I'm like, you realize that all of the, the Hemis that are in the wrecking yards are all old ones, right? I typically love New York style pizza, even though I've never been. Well, you can still get that style of pizza somewhere else. Tidal say affects idle quality. Would it negatively affect throttle response? I don't know that those two are linked. I say to heck with it. So I'm polishing the connecting rod for my new 125 Trail 70. On, on a single cylinder, I think you definitely should do that. <laughs> the question becomes a little more a little more difficult if you have to do a whole bunch of them. If you have to do it on your V12, then you're like, hey, is this really going to do anything? Do I need to spend all this time on 12 connecting rods? We're all going to have pizza for dinner tonight. I know tonight's a date night. I'm excited. My dream car would be a Chevrolet Chevette <laughs> with a stroker big block. See, that's a thing. That's that's why that's why this uh, industry and and the world in general. That's why it's awesome because people have different ideas. Canadian bacon, good sauerkraut. Nah, not for me. With sauce on the bottom. Pontiac with Mickey Thompson. Hemi heads work good. Which wish the research on small but Ford cams was as abundant as the LS. The old BMW six cylinders are boat anchors. Really? Even the M series motors? Polish them with a mil spec shot peen. How about steak strips? Oh yeah. Steak strips on anything. And then if you bacon wrap those, like we had some, last night we had bacon wrapped shrimp and, or, or either shrimp or prawns. I think it was the bigger ones, but it was, you know, it's bacon wrapped. So bacon wrapped bacon is good. Just for curiosity, I looked into the Dodge V10 aftermarket camshaft selection and did not find any from the big names. There, there is not. No, I, I thought that somebody had. Um, uh, I know Comp has Viper cams, or they had them listed in their catalogs. So I know that they had Viper cams. They may not have had any for the the other V10. I don't know if the cams interchange. The truck V10 was different. I don't know if those cams interchange, but they did offer cams for the early Vipers. All the Hemis I can find are the early models. Yeah, everything I see in a wrecking yard. I've never seen a late model Hemi in a wrecking yard. I like crowd on my bratwurst, but not on my pizza. I don't even like it on, on hot dogs. I do like Costco hot dogs. Can you build this junkyard 5.3 in a parking lot while you're on a day later? <laughs> All the waiters stopped by and whispered to you that there was a problem with your credit card. Since LSA doesn't affect low-end power... If a guy isn't worried about idle quality and your peak power is at 6,000 RPM, a really tight LSA seems like it would be a good choice. 
I don't understand your statement about since LSA doesn't affect low end power. I thought we just went over that it does. Everything is better wrapped in bacon. Thing ghouly night. <laughs> Generally, a wider LSA makes for a smoother idle. A tight LSA makes for a choppier idle. Regarding idle, also EFI tends to tame the choppiness of a wild cam. Costco makes good fresh pizza. I, I have tried, in fact, that's a standing joke between my wife and I whenever we go to Costco. I'm like, you know what? I really need to get a slice of that pizza. She's like, yeah, you can. But every time you get it, you don't like it. So I don't know how many times we have to go through this. I'm like, yeah, but it, it's, it's pizza and it looks like it would be good. She's like, no, every time you get it, you don't like it. So I, I stick with the hot dog. Toy, like a toyga. Yes, generally speaking, if you tighten up the LSA, it does tend to reduce piston to valve clearance, whether or not you know, it tightens it. So in general, it changes it, but how much you have, how much you had to start with, and then how much you have after that, you know, that's, that depends on your starting point. My wife is always right. She's always awesome. Is following the firing order the best way to adjust rockers? 60% are saying yes. So 60% are saying that, Richard, you have no idea what you're doing. Made a pot of chili, so it's chili night every night for a week. But chili's good when it's cold, and especially if you have um, some kind of bread, like sourdough bread or, or really any kind of uh, French bread, any kind of loaf, whatever is good for that. Costco pizza is good enough for what it, run, for what it runs you. It is inexpensive, although I, I like the Little Caesars pizza better than I like Costco's pizza. Have you tried new, using knockoff headsets for boosted applications? I don't think I've ever tried. I've tried some aftermarket. I don't think I tried studs. We tried some aftermarket bolts, um, like head bolts, and they were awful. They were very, very stretchy. Lasagna, also good. My wife makes a really good lasagna. Only answered no because I just joined and heard your comments on the poll. <laughs> now I want chili. That's it. Whenever we bring something up, that's what happens, right? Caesar is breadly, if you is bready, if you're into that. A tighter LSA will make the engine come up on the cam sooner. But fall off sooner also. Widen the LSA to widen the power band. Less peak than tight but broader power band. The cam knife could be called. Camberite? I, I know I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Well, it could be called Camelot. <laughs> That's what I called my, and I saw that, I saw that those guys from Brian Tooley stole that from me. The, I used to have an area way back and you guys probably saw it. I'm sure on maybe on the live feeds, I had an area back at West tech where I had just a stack of cams over in one area on top of a thing. And so, <laughs> so that's what I called it. Since there were a lot of cams there. I called it Camelot. And then I saw that recently they did a post of, of, and they have way more cams obviously in their warehouse and that that's what they called it was Camelot. So I'm like, yeah, that's a really good idea. That's, that's a, that's a, that's a good description. I, I wonder who thought of that. Come on. Man, I like it like that. You can get cooking pots that clamp onto the exhaust. <clears throat> I'd like to see some homemade headsets made from threaded rod. That would be good. Some all thread headsets. Chili and cinnamon rolls. Have 
you ever dropped a lift for while doing a cam swap on a dyno? I, we have. <clears throat> I, I did one when we were doing a, we did a, I had a TV show that I did uh, way back. We did a competition and we were doing a cam swap. We, we ran the motor and then to see after running the motor and stop and stop the motor. And we both, there were two dynos. So we both run in and do a cam swap. And then the first one to start the motor after the new cam swap was the winner. And we did drop a lifter <laughs> and we just started it on seven because I didn't take it back out. I eventually had to take it apart and take it back out, but I have done that before. And usually that's because the, you know, I mean, you know how I do it. The motors that I use are all these ratty junkyard motors with lots of miles on them. And when they have lots of miles on them, what that means is the, the lifter trays tend to wear out because the, you know, lots of up and down on the lifter wears it and lots of heat, uh, heat cycles and stuff. And so the thing, they get bad. And that's, that's what allows the lifter sometimes to rotate. And then that takes the cam out and takes the lifter out and all kinds of stuff. But I have had them drop before. Once had chili with lamb meat. Um, I've had venison chili before. Maybe a tight 106 with a cam, like a 224, 50 on a 383 Chevy. Sure. Speaking of cinnamon rolls, it's king cake season here in southeast Louisiana. They ship all over, too. Good time to try one. Um, I, I think I, I would definitely be up for... Um, Cafe Du Monde, the, the beignets, we really like those. Luckily, they have those. That we used to go to downtown Disney to go get those because they have a Cafe Du Monde in downtown Disney. I got $35 of pumpernickel for a six-gallon batch of bread beer on the topic of sourdough. Okay. So, Thumper, you had uh, black bear chili. I've never heard of that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, during the live stream or evil. Richard, when you build a new engine, do you ever lap the piston rings? I don't. Do you do you do that so that they seat better in the ring groove? <laughs> when did this turn into a cooking show? Exactly. What's a good aftermarket lifter to using? Are you talking about an, an alternative lifter to using the plastic lifter trays? You should use the plastic lifter trays. They work fantastic. You should just not use ones that have three or 400,000 miles on them. And when you use the plastic lifter trays, do not get cheap ones. Get GM ones. People who make their piston rings lap them. Yeah, I didn't ever, I didn't think that that was necessary unless we ever had a fitment issue in the, in the piston. Elk chili has no competition. So elk chili is the, apparently the best, right? I'm indifferent to the LSA argument, but after seeing your LSA video and listening to you, it sounds like there are some benefits to having a tighter LSA. You, you should pick the camshaft to do what you want the camshaft to do. Talking about camshafts in terms of LSA is like talking about them in terms of lift or talking about in terms of duration. It, it's not the discussion you should have. You should get the camshaft to do what you want the camshaft to do, which are valve vents. You ever get to visit the, if you ever get to visit the USA, my first stop would, if I ever get to visit the USA, okay, that's why I was confused. My first stop would be Heart Attack Grill in Vegas and then any, any in and out Burger and <laughs> Summit Megastore. Those are all good. I've lapped chrome rings in a hard sleeve. When you're lapping them, are you using um, emery cloth and oil and sandpaper or something? What are you using? I had shawarma yesterday. So you did You did go get shawarma. Nice. <laughs> Tastes like it belongs at a circle track food stand in a good way. Nice. Always lap the rings. They will seal better every time. I'll always lap the rings. 
Are, are you lapping? What What are you lapping on the rings? You're not lapping the ceiling facing, right? The the part that 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 connects to the cylinder wall. Six hundred ten paper on a granite table. Rings with a molly insert can trap lapping compound. So why, Dave, uh, Dave, why are you lapping the, the ring? You're changing the thickness of the, of the ring. Why are you doing that? What head gas could you prefer for boost? Um, the ones that we ran in the Big Bang motor were the factory LS9s, and I don't put copper spray on new ones if the, if the, head gasket is new and the deck has just been surfaced and on the head and on the, and on the block, I don't put copper spray on it. Uh, Andy, yeah, you're free to do whatever you want. You could either go look at re dyno results from cams that you know what they'll do, or you could go pick something else that you think you that you think it will do what you want it to do. <laughs> either way. On chrome rings, you're lapping the face. So the face that touches the cylinder wall, right? So are you trying to make it less smooth? In the 70s, Manly would make pistons with tight top ring grooves just so that you could lap the rings. So you're just trying to optimize the... Um, the ring spacing in the ring bore, right? In the ring groove. So are you trying to stop ring flutter or something? Are you trying to stop ring movement in there? Okay, 59% are saying yes. Uh, is following the firing order the best way to adjust rockers? The um, key word in there was best. Is it the best? If 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 ever there's a question about the best, you could pretty much assume that there's no best. Yeah, I'll have to look into more about. Because if you're lapping the ring, you can only take material away. So what if you are you already have more than enough clearance? <laughs> exactly, Scott. Compression getting in behind the ring, but I don't know. You're 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 adding more clearance there, though. You open the ring gap with a face lap on the rings. Not for clearance, for finish. I'm going to have to look and see what the procedure is to 
scuff the facing of the ring. Do you agree with my statement that a change in LSA and only a change in LSA might be worth a few horsepower? Might, might only be worth a few horsepower. Uh, my statement would be, um, it depends. What are you changing it? What is the cam to begin with? What is the combination you have it in? What are you changing it from? And what are you changing it to? I make a fixture in the lathe to hold the ring at the bore size, snap the ring in the groove and sand them until they shine 100% all the way around. The bottom only needs lapping. And are you, and you're doing that so that the ring will seat in faster or something? I'll I'll talk to um so now I'm going to talk to um oh what the heck Lake I'll talk to Lake at Total Seal and ask him about that So I would think I would think unless you're using really really mild sandpaper like a thousand or twelve hundred or something that you'd have you'd be able to see microscopic grooves on the face you heard lifters being installed with the oiling hole facing toward the rear of the engine or doesn't matter it doesn't matter that they work both ways if you look at a factory engine there's no directional uh there's no direction for the lifters they go in every which way it doesn't matter there are some guys that like, I talked to Brian about this and um, he said, I'll usually put them all in one direction <laughs> just, just because it makes me feel better, but it's not a thing. What's your opinion on true duels versus a wide pipe on a 5.3? I don't know. That's something I want to test. Somebody, it may, may have been you, somebody was telling me that a, that a wide pipe will make more low-speed torque, and I'd like to try that. Um, there is stuff to be had from exhaust tuning, and I, I want that to be the case. I don't know if it is for sure, but... There are also procedures for hard chrome sleeves. Richard, don't forget about the Gen 2 LT1. Oh, so you want to see a, a, a M90 on the LT1? I can tell you I'm not going to be lapping rings anytime in the near future. <laughs> Isn't that what the crosshatch and the bore and the break-in procedure is for? Todd, what's going on? And on that, I've already been here like over time. <laughs> on that note, it is time to go. Remember, there's no best for almost anything. There's only your best. And I'll see you guys all tonight. Bear, bear, bear.